Och tronen klöster en getal kjösses minlom av vilka sig gålat har sagt en fyrkin fortsätt där ett rum hos en egen och rera hos en kyrkin kjökt och svett på sig och ett hovet och så. I kommalisken gom och krakas banakt där de talar för brini i sitt som är med och obar sin institut och hovet och nu och så. May I say straight away, dear friend, president of the university, excellencies and the many distinguished guests, uh, how much I appreciated the invitation from uh, Professor Brian McGrath to come and speak on, on this occasion. May I begin? I not only want to thank you for the kind invitation to address a uh, conference here in this magnificent venue, uh, but I do also want to wish uh, uh, Professor Fabrini. Uh, every success in his new institute. It is an important addition uh, to the consideration uh, that we will all have to make as to the future of Europe. The institute, uh, we've entered a time in which we are, all of us, attempting to make a reflection on what form of union might engage the hearts and minds of peoples with different sources and experiences of citizenship. And I do know, and I'm so pleased to meet a, an old friend, Hilary Ben, earlier, uh, that the future of our relationship with our nearest neighbor, the future of the shared legal framework and institutions which have done so much to bring peace to this island, are rightly to the forefront of the minds of governments. And of course, while I, as president of Ireland, share these concerns and I'm very anxious to be briefed on their, their evolution, my remarks this morning, as you have said, President, are to the deeper issue, of which they are, of course, a part, the future of the European Union. President Emeritus of the European Council, Ian Carlul, your distinguished guest, Akkadji Illig, dear friend, we civilizations now know ourselves to be mortal. When these words were written by Paul Verri in 1919, he was reflecting on the devastation that the empires of Europe had inflicted upon themselves, upon their subjects, and upon so many others, through the devotion of their formidable industrial power and scientific knowledge to total war and mutual destruction. Everything has not been lost, Valerie continued, but everything has sensed that it might perish. An extraordinary shudder ran through the marrow of Europe. Maybe a similar great shudder might have reinforced, perhaps by, reinforced perhaps by the further slaughter of the Second World War, might have been felt by the leaders of the six European nation states who met in Rome 61 years ago on the 25th of March 1957, to lay the foundations of the European Union. Aware that Europe had, for the second time in the century, come to the brink of total moral and material collapse, reached an, an adir in relation to respect for human life itself, freedom, dignity, the founders of European integration were seeking to invoke a new shape to their relationships a shape that would give longevity to what might be a potential European solidarity of peoples, and in the process, develop instruments that would achieve this, shared institutions of peaceful cooperation. Valerie's shudder reminds us of the importance of context and how we must, in our reflection, be aware of changes in context, whether they are stated or hidden. The commitment given to each other by the six founding states in Rome stood in contrast, after all, to that imperial impulse which had subjected Europe to decades, if not centuries, of warfare, and certainly for many peoples of the world was the insatiable source of centuries of oppression. Only five months before that fateful meeting in Rome in 1957, Conrad Adenauer, the Chancellor of West Germany, and Guy Mollet, the Prime Minister of France, while conducting negotiations in Paris on the shape of the future common market, 
were interrupted by a phone call from the then British Prime Minister, Anthony Eden, who informed a shocked leader, a shocked French leader, that Britain was unilaterally withdrawing from the Anglo-French attack on Egypt as the military adventure had incurred the displeasure of the United States. It was a salutary lesson for all three leaders. They were learning that European nations could no longer continue to subject large swathes of the planet to imperial rule and intervention without international implications. Of course, at that time, the majority of the peoples of the global south still faced a long and unremitting struggle for independence, self-determination, and national freedom. That struggle is one that we must never forget as Europeans. Its heart carries the imprint of a legacy of empire. It is part of the European legacy that must be acknowledged. And we have been so slow to do it. It is a legacy that requires to be transacted in an adequate ethical exercise of remembering. The consequences of its being perceived as continuing to exist in alternative forms in the collective memories at the other side of the equation, without acknowledgement and without being confronted, I believe erodes mutual trust. However, let us in Ireland never forget either that while the imperial project was one under which this country suffered, it was also one in the administration and defense of which many of our people partook in the past. The best aspirations for European integration then gave an expression to a very different logic to that which had plunged the continent and the world into war twice in a century. These aspirations represented much more than a yearning for idealism, which was so strong in European philosophy, but they, and they still represent today the triumph of idealism over cynicism, of hope over fear, and of the promise of international solidarity and new collective achievements over the lure of any seduction to the abuse of national power. Sovereignty in the new circumstances envisioned, it was suggested would be neither imposed nor would it be extinguished, as it had been so often in the European past. It would be shared and thus in its sharing being able to create not an exclusive and demarcated zone of control, but a common space, one which endures today, one in which our citizens might travel, study and work, work freely encountering each other in a spirit of friendship and amity. Aspects of it, of course, have come to be. Over three million students have crossed borders to study, over one million babies have been born to couples who studied under the Erasmus program. It is important to recall that the objectives which the Union commits itself, now contained in Article 3 of the Treaty on European Union, reflect in Teralia the inheritance of some of Europe's most egalitarian and humane traditions. We hear little of this. Those were traditions that in their source of course were not confined to Europe. They included, after all, traditions that had in many instances been brought to Europe from afar. I think, for example, of the many enlightenments that are around the history of the planet, rather than one. Those were traditions, as I said as well, too. That rich scholarship, philosophy, moral instinct, and general impulse had contributed to and drew on an enriched European thought. And it was felt it would yield an impulse towards the promotion of social justice and protection, equality between men and women, solidarity between generations, economic and social cohesion, and solidarity between member states. And these principles, of course, reached their fullest expression through the rights enumerated in the Charter of Fundamental Rights which has had legal effect throughout the Union since 2009. May I suggest that the past 10 years have severely tested our collective commitment to such a rich and enabling moral patrimony. 
the trajectory towards increasing inequalities of income, wealth, power, and opportunities within societies and between nation states, evident since the early 1980s, has continued and continues to be presented in some arrogant rejection of empirical test or adequate consideration as to social consequences. I realize as I'm giving this paper, other conversations are taking place in Davos, and they have a particular color. I think that all of this was presented as some natural order of things, rather than the outcome of a policy paradigm that was sourced, let us be scholarly about this, in a narrow version of political economy, which has yielded so painfully slowly, if at all, to any critique and even more slowly to change, an issue for policymakers. We have had a tacit and in recent decades accommodating narrowing of intellectual work. I think of the syllabus of Economics 101 across the economics departments of the Western world. We have an, in an intolerance of critique and a blind acceptance of a unilinear vision of growth the components of which I repeat, are neither made matters of adequate empirical critique and even less so of social test as to consequences. As a consequence, economic and social cohesion has fractured and political policies resiling to and deploying rhetoric once thought banished from the continent of Europe has been, such forces have seized their moment and such expressions have begun to reemerge. In the absence of an adequate and inclusive discourse, and emboldened by those who seek to mimic the language of the far right for short-term electoral advantage, these political forces, exploiting and drawing on the despair, alienation, and enemy of so many citizens, seek to divide us against one another on the grounds of ethnicity, religion, and nationality. And while not succeeding in recent electoral contests in achieving majorities in the short term, their gains represent a formidable challenge to any future social cohesion. I think in responding to these developments, it is important that we use our language carefully, use words such as populist, nationalist, and ethnic with great care. These words and concepts, after all, have in history been used for emancipatory purposes on occasion. We must instead have the courage to engage with the factors that have sourced and facilitate the abuse of such terms in current circumstances. We are entering a time when for the first time in many years the future shape of the European Union has become a matter of contestation and I hope everyday debate. And this conference today reflects that realization. In the shadow, of course, in the United Kingdom referendum result, and of those social forces which have given rise to so much doubt across Europe, we are invited to imagine and define through deliberation, and with regard, of course, to the necessary courtesies of discourse, the outlines of the European Union that we seek. The European Commission, under the leadership of President Janka, issued a very welcome white paper on the future of Europe last March, and has issued a number of reflection papers on globalization, on deepening economic and monetary union, on the future of European defense, the future of the Union's financial framework, and what the Commission has referred to since the 1980s as the social dimension. This, of course, complements the report issued by the presidents of the Commission, European Central Bank, European Parliament Eurogroup, and the European Council on proposals for the completion of economic and monetary union. Political leaders across the Union have begun to make their own contributions. Some seem to seek or envisage as adequate a renewal in the existing institutional arrangements and practice, while some have called for a methodological revision I do not share their optimism in terms of adequacy. May I take the opportunity, therefore, to welcome in particular the interventions by President Macron, 
in Athens and the Sorbonne in Paris, in favor of recognizing and acknowledging the depth of the crisis of social connection that threatens any version of a strong, efficient, and inclusive Europe. Some of us may not agree with the totality of the argument presented, but I would like to recognize the courage, the vigor, and the spirit in which it has been offered in those speeches. References to Europe as a metamorphosis. In enunciating his vision and his program, and it is refreshing to see a leading politician outline a program for Europe, he has enriched and enlivened what has been for some time a moribund debate. However, I stress that it is important that it be clearly understood from the outset that any Franco-German agreement on the future of the Union will not suffice to answer the deep and sincerely held concerns of those who have sought as their hopes for the European Union the vindication of their aspirations for it to be a union of equals for the benefit of all European citizens. I think this raises questions which can be considered again as to whether any of what I say can be achieved within a Europe of different speeds. And again, in preparing this paper, I was very clear of the current profile of deficit and, uh, and surplus in the European Union. After all, it is a union in one economy of uh, surplus of 700 billion and another of a deficit of 350, and so on. You can reflect on that yourselves as the constituent parts of an effective union. But above all, I would like to agree with President Macron in the strongest terms that we are at a moment when we must recognize that the union cannot, as in the past, be reconstructed from above, but can only, if it is to survive in this new century, achieve social cohesion be renewed and rebuilt from below. This is necessary if we are to recover any sense of authenticity in our pursuit of the democratic ideals invoked at the founding of the Union, so recently recap recapitulated by the leaders of the 27 in Rome last March and used to legitimate really every successive treaty change since that time. For so many citizens in the Union, these ideals cannot be recognized in the social outcomes of policies that often indeed seem to contradict such language and its principles. Public spectacles replete with rhetorical flourishes have come to be perceived by European citizens as simply an abuse of the symbolic space, an inadequate disguise for the absence of authenticity in the transition from policy exposition to practice. As an imbalance, for example, between competitiveness and cohesion, in European Union aspirations and rhetoric, this has deepened. It has become clear that the great challenge that confronts the Union and one of the great tasks of the next decade will be to achieve cohesiveness within the communities and between the communities of our common European home. And I include here the task facing the Irish state for itself. But such a cohesiveness might enable us as a union to practice as well, <coughs> we should remember, social responsibility abroad. It is only, I suggest, by achieving this goal, by rebuilding our capacity and our willingness to work together, to lead fulfilling lives in all spheres of human activity, that we can confront the global challenges that will be common to all humanity in this century the pressing demand for a just and sustainable development, the imperative of welcoming those fleeing war, persecution, famine, and natural disasters, and above all, the urgent necessity to address the causes of climate change and mitigate their consequences. Our common European institutions must be adequate and sufficient to enable the restoration and protection of social cohesion. This is not simply a matter of the social dimension of the Union being addressed by the recasting of those existing directives relating to the social acquis, as important as they may be. Restoring social cohesion requires something far more searching, nothing less than a critical examination of the institutional framework of economic and monetary union, the assumptions on which they operate, and of the manner in which we understand globalization by which I mean inter alia, 
the liberalization of capital and goods markets, and the consequential rise of the economic and largely non-transparent power and authority of the multinational corporations. Neglecting this critique, advocating for business as usual, while failing to take on these challenges, is to allow this century to emerge as an authoritarian one, one in which the opposing extremes in the European street will come not from any mediating institutions, already weakened, often denied support. In the atmosphere of a single version of economic theory, many of the mediating institutions have been damaged, and sometimes they are unfairly presented as simply being a colluding a part of the apparatus of an imposed austerity. There is nothing inevitable in any of what I have described. And we should have really, I think, by now, rejected and moved on from such hubristic and fallacious prognostications as those of Professor Fukuyama. There is an alternative vision available that can be offered for an emancipatory, rights-based European international vision. That, too, is in our heritage. And there is a scholarship and a practice that, su that sustains such an option. For example, one of the most morally compelling visions of European internationalism, considered by the European institutions as one of the founding documents of European integration, emerged, as Professor Fabrini will know, from the Italian resistance movement in that remarkable manifesto composed in 1941 on the island of Ventetene by Altiero Spinelli, a member of the Italian Communist Party and Ernesto Rossi, one of the founders of the anti-fascist, Giustizia e Libertà. The Manifesto of Entertaine, in its emphasis on the people's economy, the shared prospect of humanity, composed as it was in captivity, is remarkable for containing a demand for a federation of European states dedicated to disarming the worst passions of European nationalisms, and in asserting that such a federation could only be achieved and would only be preserved if it was capable of continuing what it referred to as the historical process of the struggle against social inequalities and privileges. And of recognizing, it went on, the economic forces must dominate man, but rather for the forces of nature, they must be subject to man guided and controlled by him in the most rational way so that the broader strata of the population will not become their victims. Professor Spinelli was writing before we'd achieved gender equality in rhetoric. These demands were not modest and they required in the eyes of the authors of the manifesto the social regulation of private property, the nationalization of utilities, an egalitarian distribution of both urban and rural land, equality of educational opportunities, and the displacement of charity by the provision of, I quote, food, lodging, clothing, and that minimum of comfort needed to preserve a sense of human dignity. The home of the European Parliament which gives democratic voice to the emerging European demos, is now named after Altiero Spinelli. Let us not forget either that the democratic nation states, which emerged after the Second World War in Western Europe, were influenced by those who had led the resistance. The constitutions adapted at the end of the Second World War contained social and economic rights, which were given a material reality through the construction of national welfare states. And these constitutional initiatives represented distinctive national traditions, reflecting both historical contingency, path dependency, structure, and agency. They were not merely idealistic, they were pragmatic in the best sense, and they sought their support, and they got it, from the European street. Neither were they in any technical sense, because of this, perceived as lesser. In fact, their proposals had an empirically based scholarship as sources of policy. And it is a rich one, as any of us who have studied it know. The British Labour government of 1945-51 to 51 pursued its New Jerusalem, something Harlaski called a revolution by consent through a commitment to full employment, 
nationalisation of major industries, the construction of the National Health Service, and the reform and strict control of the financial sector. The French Fourth Republic created a technical public body composed of economists, the Commissariat General du Plan, to coordinate and plan on an indicative basis the post-war economy. In Germany, the post-war federal government was heavily influenced by the economic philosophy of order liberalism, first promulgated by leading economists in the 1920s, which envisioned the role of the state as the creator and regulator of the competitive market economy. The origin of the term social market economy can be found in the writings of Alfred muller armack though the Germany which developed may have been somewhat more social than the order liberals were comfortable with, and Germany's corporatist model reflected the traditions and strengths of Europe's most powerful and influential labour and trade movement. Taken together, while they did not reflect all of the most fervent hopes of the leading, or the, of the leading elements of the wartime anti-fascist movement, and particularly its communist and socialist components, these developments did reflect a post-war mind of Europe that recognized a role for the state, and they constituted a great advance in the recognition of social rights and of the responsibility of the democratic state to regulate, govern, and manage the economy in the interests of all the people. I have outlined these admittedly stylized and necessarily exaggerated portraits, even while omitting four of the original six, the social democracies of Northern Europe, the nations of the communist bloc, the Iberian countries then under the rule of dictators, and of course the Irish state, to provide an illustration of the diversity of institutions in the leading industrial countries in post-war Europe. Now, students of comparative political economy and comparative social policy will be very aware of the construction of typologies of European states by reference to a constellation of historically determined economic, social, and political arrangements. For example, the political economists Peter Hall and David Soskis have used the term varieties of capitalism to refer to analytically distinct models of capitalism, while the Danish sociologist Gösta Esping Andersen identified in his 1990 work the three worlds of welfare capitalism, three distinct welfare regimes. Now, while there is an argument that all states can be shown to have begun under the influence of a hegemonic economic discourse, <coughs> overdue in terms of critique, to converge towards a turbocharged version of the liberal model, we can still identify strikingly different economic and social institutions, whether in the labor market, in the financing and ownership of and relations between firms, or in the degree to which states meet the most basic needs of their citizens. Scholars of comparative economic and social institutions can, of course, construct any number of typologies to classify and compare nation states and the member states of the European Union. What matters now is whether the project of European integration is capable of drawing are willing to draw on this diverse array of institutions. And if in its project of integration, it can be sustained and enhanced by recognizing diversity, and whether such an integration can meet the demand for social justice and social cohesion. There is a nightmare possibility that the diversity I have described will not be taken into account that the adjustment to an unempirically tested market without the need for popular assent will prevail. Asserting that diversity has been recognized, asserting it will not be sufficient. The European street will seek evidence in their life that it has. The demand for social cohesion was, we should not forget, recognized at the beginning of the Union. The institutional origins of the Union lie in the Schumann Declaration, Giving, given legal form through the Treaty of Paris, which established the European coal and steel community. The coal and steel community contained the embryonic components of the future Europe, a technocratic executive in the form of a high authority, a parliamentary assembly, a court of justice, a council of national ministers, and a common regulated market 
in coal and steel. That community reflected a melange of the social market and dirigisme models. The high authority had significant powers to fund and direct investment, yet it was also committed to combat excess concentrations or abuse of dominant market positions. That now is a battle lost. And we are left with flimsy rationalizations of the inevitability of this process and with occasional hubristic flourishes as to its ultimate universal benefits. This, frankly, and should be acknowledged, is an ideological position that has consistently eschewed empirical test. Though one would not say the early institutional forms of the European Union, as I described them, were infused deeply with the spirit of Ventetene, it was significant that the high authority of the coal and steel community was empowered to direct enterprises to raise wages, to instruct states to compensate workers for wage reductions, to direct financial aid to offset the negative effects of technological advances in the industry on the workforce, including programs of early retirement, transition and allowances, mobility grants, and retraining. Let us recall, too, that these features were felt to be required in order to give that community legitimacy in the eyes of the workers, particularly those German workers in the Rhineland who will be most directly affected by a shared approach to coal and steel. The Social Democratic Party of Germany, refounded in 1946 on the principle of a socialist Germany in a socialist Europe, was profoundly suspicious of any project of European integration led by its domestic opponents. Its leader, Karl Schumacher, feared what he saw as a Europe constructed on the foundations, in his words, of capitalism, clericalism, conservatism, and cartels. Kurt Schumacher, a politician of immense moral courage, imprisoned at Broken Wall by the Nazis for 10 years, was a, a very early exemplar of the truth that one can be a passionate advocate of European unity and at the same time be a trenchant critic and opponent, indeed, of defective institutional design and the absence of ethical intent in the specific projects of the Union. And when the European Economic Community was formed in 1957, it took the form of a political commitment to create a common market. In retrospect, of course, all things can take on the appearance of inevitability. But we must recall that for Jean Monnet, whom you have quoted, the intellectual architect of the coal and steel community, the common market was a scheme considered too vague. And to a man who was, after all, the leading technician within Le Commissariat General du Plan, too economically liberal to succeed in ensuring European integration. In 1955, Jean Monnet posed the question, is it possible to have a common market without federal, social, monetary, and macroeconomic policies? As to the first point, that of a common social policy, and here I very much concur with Perry Anderson, that it is of no small significance that social considerations came first in Jean Monnet's thinking. The International Labour Organization was asked to appoint a group of independent experts led by the Swedish economist Bert Olin to prepare a report on the social effects of closer European cooperation. There was a considerable fear, recognised in the 1956 Olin report, that a reduction in tariffs and the gradual movement towards a tariff-free common customs area, when combined with the free movement of capital, would need to an agglomeration of investment in existing centres of industry to the disadvantage of those countries with higher social and labour standards and that those countries would find it hard to raise such standards. In a word, many saw the danger of the existing social floor so hard fought for in the six becoming a social ceiling. The Ola report recommended provisions for the free movement of labour, equivalence between paid holiday schemes, and the principle of equal pay for men and women to be included in the treaties. The enumeration of a requirement of equal pay for equal work, now Articles 157 and 158 of the Treaty on the Functioning of the European Union, reflected the social provisions of the Constitution of the French Fourth Republic. 
They themselves were adaptations of the great legislative victories of the Popular Front in France in the 1930s and would prove to be of immense importance in this country when Ireland acceded to the European Economic Community. One of my predecessors as President of Ireland and indeed former Commissioner, Dr Patrick Hillary, as the first European Commissioner appointed by Ireland, ensured that these treaty obligations were reflected in a directive and furthermore, courageously, refused to grant Ireland a derogation from its provisions, despite being put under significant pressure to do so. The Olin Report reflected the assumptions of what we might now call the Bretton Woods era, that period between 1945 and 1973, in which the international policy regime for capital and finance dramatically suppressed, restricted, and regulated the role of the financial markets in allocating resources. And it did so through the control of capital movements, state ownership of banks, and other market interventions. The international monetary system revolved around a system of fixed but flexible currencies pegged to the dollar, which acted as the anchor and international reserve currency. This era has been termed one of embedded liberalism, in which governments were enabled to pursue domestic policy goals, such as full employment and the building of the welfare state. When faced by balance of payments crises, governments could restrict capital mobility or adjust their exchange rates rather than reducing government expenditure. In this context, Olin and his colleagues assumed that members of the common market would use the traditional Bretton Woods policies at their disposal to protect their desired social and labour standards. We should also recall that member states had retained a large degree of autonomy under the acquis, at least prior to the Single European Act, ones that enabled them to intervene in their own economies. Social Europe was not then deemed to be in danger, or that it was even something that it was necessary to articulate in 1957. It was generally believed that domestic autonomy would be protected, and that social policy did not need to be Europeanized to be enhanced. It was not until a summit in Paris then, in April 1972, that the social objectives of the community were recognized as being as important as its economic objectives. And it is from them that the term social Europe first became widespread. The resultant social action program of 1974 in many respects bear the hallmark and carries the spirit of the student and worker protests of, 1960, of, of, of 68. It represents what in rest respect appears to be a high point of ambition, both in terms of its analytic content and its programmatic intent. If I may quote from the second paragraph of the program submitted by the then Commission to the Council. There are continuing and in some cases worsening problems over the distribution of income and wealth within the community and over worker participation within industry. There are problems caused by the failure of the infrastructure in some sectors to keep pace with the demands on it. And then there are the problems caused by growth itself, problems of industrial pollution, of a deteriorating environment, of a conflict of values, in some cases between industry and society, disruptions to the pattern of life, and a growing dependence on migrant workers whom society is not always ready to accept as citizens, while it continues to require their services to maintain its standard of living. That was then. May I suggest that such an analysis now is unfortunately more apposite than ever. The solutions proposed were then nothing less than a harmonization of labor standards, worker participation and industrial democracy towards the highest level then extant in the community, which at that time meant West German standards and the preparation of the directive on equal pay between men and women to which I've already alluded. We must pause and think. Have we experienced recently, <clears throat> or can we imagine the European Commission of today making such proposals and in such terms, with such language? May we expect it in a joint agreed statement, conclusions from Davos. Jean Monnet reflecting in 1978 on the events of 1968 in France, 
and of the brief alliance between radical students and workers, wrote that, as I put it in Monet's work, the cause for which they had fought still remained. It was the cause of humanity. And I believe that we have still not adequately responded, either before or after that salutary warning. Can we imagine a functionaire of that stature today speaking with such acuity and with such sympathy with the European street? Our times are reflective, I suggest, of a lost discourse. A vacuum has emerged that must be filled by public discourse, a vacuum that cannot be met by competing rationalizations from the silos of the European institutions in recent decades. That very moment, the 70s, when social Europe was proposed as a solution to many of the challenges with which we still struggle today, and which may I suggest have grown in severity to this day, coincided with the beginning of a radical shift in the manner in which the relationship between economy and society was understood or construed with implications for the role of the state. I am speaking, of course, of the ideology that dares not speak its name, that political theory of economic governance known as neoliberalism. We know its structures all too well. The market, neoliberals suggest, could and should allocate resources. I restrain myself from speaking about Carilla because for another day. The pursuit of private profit, it was suggested, is far more efficient than public provision for public purposes. The laws of the market, though drafted and enforced by the state, would now carry the new logic and were elevated to the status of immutable and unchangeable laws of nature, an inevitability. It would be a mistake, may I suggest, to read the Treaty of Rome then as a sui generis legal text devoid of institutional and social context and to imply that it was a neoliberal charter. That would be to ignore the history and the context that I have outlined. The collapse of Bretton Woods regime in 1970s and the transition to an international monetary system based on international capital mobility and financial deregulation in the 1980s significantly undermined the capacity of states to rely on such mechanisms as were had been identified in the Olin report. I believe that it is important for us, if we wish to be authentic in our discourse, to recognize that this was a policy choice, reflective of new intellectual and above all political orientations within and on the part of states and international institutions. Institutions, just like political parties, have an identifiable intellectual history, which not even the best of rhetoric can cover. Globalization, and here I refer specifically to the liberalization of finance and capital markets, is far too often spoken of as if it is some kind of phenomenon that is external to the political process, one which cannot be managed, certainly not understood by ordinary citizens. An international cooperation to manage such flows however, has been painfully slow to develop. The truth is a laissez-faire philosophy still prevails. As a result, a significant minority of capital accumulators have benefited, and from such lassitude, it is publics who have been the losers. Within the European community, the response to the monetary instability of the 1970s was a suspension of plans for economic and monetary union. Instead, a number of attempts were made to establish an intra-European fixed currency regime, the most durable of which proved to be the European monetary system, a commitment to maintain fixed rates within a narrow band without frequent revaluations within the monetary system required. For some countries, policies that constituted the abandonment of full employment as a policy. Monetary policy, a key part of the Bretton Woods policy mix was subordinated to the necessity to retain fixed rates. A more advanced form of monetary cooperation was considered desirable following the Single European Act, which advanced the completion of the internal market and provided for the removal of all capital controls by 1990. Tommaso Padoa Schiappa, one of the architects of monetary union, has argued that this capital liberalization within the community inevitably led to monetary union itself. It was Padoa Schiappa who used the phrase, the inconsistent quartet, to refer to the impossibility 
of pursuing free trade, free capital mobility, fixed exchange rates, and an autonomous national monetary policy simultaneously. By the late 1980s, a political commitment to the internal market required free trade and free capital mobility, while the functioning of the common agricultural price level of the EEC's common agricultural policy required stable exchange rates. The creation of a shared currency governed by a single monetary policy under the influence of all member states was then unsurprisingly a preferred option for most member states rather than the maintenance of a fixed exchange rate regime, fidelity to which would determine each state's monetary policy. This familiar sequencing of integration was not inevitable. During the late 1960s, the six members of the European Economic Community had advanced plans to create an economic and monetary union, which would have facilitated the removal of capital controls and the further liberalisation of trade. I am referring to the Werner Plan, presented to the Council and to the Commission in 1970. It seems out of time when compared to the European monetary system and the monetary union many of the member states of the European Union are members of today. I'm just coming to the end, but let me make two observations. First, the Werner Plan envisioned a centre of economic decision-making answerable to a European Parliament elected by universal suffrage, responsible for coordinating national budgets and utilising both fiscal deficits and surpluses to maintain, amongst other objectives, full employment. And second, that the proposed centre of economic decision-making and the proposed community system of central banks should pursue the same economic objectives. We might speculate are differently such a version of institutions, or their role being underpinned by such different assumptions, might approach the economic policy of the European Union today. Instead of such a set of proposals as the Werner Plan might suggest, economic and monetary union has followed those precepts agreed at Maastricht, an independent central bank, which is solely devoted to achieving price stability, and national fiscal policies constrained by the Growth and Stability Pact, and now by the Fiscal Stability Treaty. The agreement of the Fiscal Compact, that which many have seen as a quasi-constitutionalism of anti-Keynesian macroeconomic policy, and the administrative schema which complements it, the European semester, the macroeconomic imbalance procedure, the renewed Stability and Growth Pact, and so on, have embedded another level of economic coordination. For many, and I do not just speak of those whose political careers have been spent on the left, but I think there may be some sympathy within the European institutions themselves for a similar view. The recommendations directed to countries in the European semester reflect a partial, limited, and very particular view of economic and social policy. Whether it be in the demand for flexible labour market policies or neoliberal reforms of social protection, all of course advanced under the rubric of structural adjustment. From the European street, it might be asked, where are we to discuss, see, justified, empirically tested, the assumptions that are made in these structural adjustment proposals, or the basis for the calculated possible outcomes in relation to economic growth or efficiency, not to speak of social consequences or for the loss of cohesion. The five presidents, have suggested as part of their prospectus for an economic union, a stronger focus on employment and social protection as part of the semester process. Will that be accompanied by a willingness to debate and dispute fundamental assumptions of what constitutes an efficient economic model on the part of both the Commission and Council members? How is it to be made fit with movements for a European Union of the future that might seek to build a movement for reform from below. The interpretation of the acquis communautaire by the Court of Justice of the European Union has also developed on a very particular trajectory since the mid-1970s. And that direction has had troubling implications for member states' domestic commitments to social and labour law. As Fritz Schaff and others have so convincingly detailed, Integration has occurred through case law and between the Luxembourg Compromise of 1966 and the re-emergence of qualified majority voting in the late 1980s, it played the leading role. Its early landmark judgments, and there are many, and I'll just give one, 
the European Court of Justice declared that it saw itself as being at the centre of a new supranational legal order and through the doctrines of the supremacy and direct effect of European Union law became a key driver of integration. The construction of this legal order took place through the referral of cases by national courts to the Court of Justice. By its nature, this form of integration was negative, taking the form of the striking down of what are considered barriers to the freedom of free movement of goods, service, capital and workers. While there may have been disquiet regarding the closing of the scope for member states to regulate business on grounds that it violates the rules of the market embedded in the treaties, Few ex expected that the Court of Justice would elevate those economic freedoms above what we consider fundamental rights, such as the right to strike. Yet, for example, the so-called Laval Quartet of cases in the late 2000s raised the prospect that the Court would do just that, and it has. Furthermore, they raised the prospect that the social keys would operate as a ceiling rather than a floor. These judgments are reached before the incorporation of the Charter of Fundamental Rights into the Acquis. And I hope, as I know that many of us who advocated for the Lisbon Treaty in this country do, that the Charter will have an appreciative effect on judicial reasoning when fundamental rights seem to conflict with economic freedoms. History tells us that we should not be optimistic. However, may I suggest, that these judgments reflect the confluence of a number of very specific logics. First, that the treaties reflect, above all, a European economic constitution, which establishes a framework for a very specific model of the market economy. Second, the continuing influence of neoliberal philosophy. And finally, that until social and labour rights are categorically given the same priority, if not a higher one, as economic freedoms and the treaties, the latter will prevail. These issues must be clarified by public debate and through engagement with the European street. And may I suggest on this, the delicate balance between the economy and society. It was implicit in the work of the Commission when it was led by Jacques Delors in the 1980s. The single European Act was above all, as the legal scholar Christian Jurgis has suggested, a project of integration through market building. It represented a re-regulation of an expanded new market as evidenced by European legislation on consumer protection, health, safety, protection of the environment. Jacques Delors, as we know so well, recognised that the creation of this new market demanded a form of regulation at least equal in scope and effect. Yet we also know that his vision was not fulfilled and that the social charter, as welcome and hard fought for as it was, has proved inadequate. Indeed, in this time of declining trade union membership, the voice of the representatives of Labour has never seemed weaker. Possibilities of social dialogue have been weakened. We have not yet reckoned with the consequences of the profound collision of the social and the economic that is represented by the Single European Act and the Maastricht Treaty. National social policies and national economic policies designed to ensure social protection must now comply with the exigencies and demands of an internal market whose intrinsic logic is ever more informed by neoliberalism. The traditional policies of the Bretton Woods era are no longer possible within the confines of economic and monetary union. Yes, the Treaty of Amsterdam was a very welcome if partial attempt to regulate this new European market and to coordinate the action of member states through the inclusion of employment charter. And yes, the Treaty of Lisbon by enumerating the values and objectives of the Union and settling the question of whether the Charter of Fundamental Rights was part of the Acquis, represented in advance. The five precedents have suggested that economic and monetary union will lead, ultimately lead to a banking, fiscal and political union. As the political negotiations on the shape of the banking union, more importantly, of course, the future financing of the single resolution fund for failed banks is ongoing, I cannot comment directly on that issue. I do, however, wish to suggest that the European street will not give their consent and support to the creation of what they correctly see as an enduring austerity union. The internal market cannot be the ne plus ultra of the European legal order. We must recall that for the European street, indeed for all Democrats in the Union, 
The laws of the market are seen as and must be experienced as instrumental, not intrinsic. The economy, as the manifesto of entertainment reminds us, must be subordinated and subject to the democratic will of the people. I've spoken of the diversity of our economic and social models and their history in Europe. Let us take, I suggest, this observed diversity, not as a negative, but as a medley of opportunities which we should celebrate and from which we could extract the very best materials for the future. I do not wish to be too prescriptive on the kind of institutional required in the coming years. But why I have just said what I have said? It let me suggest a number of questions that I see as crucial. Can the macroeconomic framework of the European Union sanction a protected diversity of models, both in terms of welfare states and alternative models of capitalism? Can the formulation of monetary policy be accommodative of such difference? Can the rules of the internal market yield where they can surrender when they must to the demands of the dignity of labour? May I suggest that to the European street, the very project of European integration at its best was and is itself instrumental. As post-war Europeans were invited not only to vindicate those values and objectives of which the Union came into existence, and to which indeed it is now constitutionally committed, even if they are contradicted by social outcomes too often. They support a European Union values, which they saw as necessary, and above all else which could bring an end to centuries of internecine war and of imperial domination. Rosa Luxemburg once stated, not European solidarity, but international solidarity, embracing every region, race, and people on earth, every partial solidarity, is not a stage towards the realization of genuine internationality, but its opposite, its enemy, an ambiguity under which lurks the cloven hoof of national antagonism. The First World War should have taught us that peace does not rest on common markets or globalization. That war occurred at a high point of the interconnection of free capital and goods markets. No, peace depends on a shared commitment to one another, on our capacity for compassion and empathy and sympathy, and to institutions which do not divide or harm society, but rather institutions which unite and protect it, which offer promise of what is yet to be attained. Let us therefore in the European Union lift our gaze to encompass all of the needs of all humanity, taking account of all of their history, their possible future, and let us do so with recognition of all our shared cultural diversity. After all, the challenges which will test the European Union in this century that I have mentioned, climate change, global migration, the future of work, sustainable development, they are common to us all on our fragile and shared planet. Our best aspirations, our sustainable future, can only be met by restoring social cohesion, and promoting social justice within our institutions here at home, within the institutions of the European Union, within our global institutions, sadly under threat, our multilateralism made dangerous again. Our horizons must be limitless, for we, all of us, owe to each other an imprescriptible moral duty. May I conclude by saying we need a new mind for our times, a mind informed by hope rather than fear, not only for Europe, but for humanity itself on our shared and vulnerable planet. Mila Buikas, Karamak.